In this video, we'll look at solving initial value problems using SciPy's built-in differential equation solver. Back in the day when I was taking my first advanced class in uh, classical mechanics, the textbook had these problems that were computer problems, so you couldn't solve these by hand uh, for the most part. You had to come up with your own way to numerically integrate the resulting differential equations. And I, At the time, I thought that was kind of cool, and little did I know I'd end up doing computational physics for a living. We'll take one of the problems out of the early chapters of that book and come up with a solution using SciPy. We're going to look at the rather morbid uh, problem of a high altitude skydiver who jumps uh, from a height of 32 kilometers, has a mass of 70 kilograms, and his chute unfortunately does not open and he goes splat. So the first uh, part of the question asks to calculate to the nearest uh, second how long it'll take uh, to hit the ground from that height given a constant acceleration, g, and no air resistance. Part b of the problem wants us to again calculate the uh, time of the fall to the nearest second, giving an equation for the drag force here uh, as a function of velocity, and this uh, proportionality constant is assumed actually to be a constant. In part c, they want us to calculate the time given that the drag coefficient is a function of altitude, and then to assume that the acceleration due to gravity, g, also changes as a, as a function of height above the ground. And lastly, the question asks just for the plots of uh, acceleration, velocity, and position um, as a function of time, just for part c, but we'll do that for all parts. So before we get going with the actual coding, the solution to part A uh, is easy to do. It's high school physics and it can be done with pen and paper and you don't need a computer, although we will solve it numerically in a bit. Um, it's just the height change is equal to one half the acceleration due to gravity times the time squared. So you just rearrange the equation, plug in the numbers we're given, and you get a time of 81 seconds. So our code better produce the same result. If you can do this simple type of estimation or do some sort of limiting, ca limiting case calculation with your problems, I advise doing so. It's kind of a pet peeve of mine when uh, people don't do it and it's easy, easy to do. I had an engineer come to me once and ask me to verify a calculation he did of a temperature rise for a cell. And just by making some assumptions about ideal conditions, I got a temperature rise of like 60 degrees Celsius and his calculation was like a half a degree. So obviously right away we knew that there was something wrong with the calculation. But clearly you won't always be able to do that and in some cases your intuition might be wrong. Like uh, in this parachute problem, uh, when we look at the drag force, um, our intuition is you know, pretty good because we kind of deal with drags and air resistance on a daily basis, but in some cases you might not be able to do so. Or your intuition might be wrong and the pen and paper, paper calculation is actually incorrect, but at least that incorrect answer will force you to go back and look at both the assumptions you made in your limiting cases and in your code, and hopefully that will point you in the right direction. So SciPy has a solver, uh, solve underscore IVP for solve initial value problems, and it takes equations of this form here, dy dt equals some function of t and y. So it's a first, it solves first order differential equations. Now our equation is second order here. It's d squared y dt squared equals minus g, uh, but we can recast that into two first order equations just like this here. And this is a common technique. So you can solve higher order equations uh, with a you know, first order equation solver just by recasting them in terms of a system of uh, first order equations. Okay, let's start coding. So let's create a file originally called freefall.py and we're going to need to import some libraries. Obviously we're going to need numpy. Uh, so we're going to import numpy as np. We are going to need um, from scipy.integrate import solve ivp and we're going to need uh, the plotting library so let's import um, matplotlib.py plot as plt okay so next we're going to need to define our system of equations we're going to define a function just call it uh, equations for now and it's going to take an argument uh, the time time variable and our vector function y which the first component of y is going to be the position the second component will be the velocity uh, we need to set our let's see let's set our mass equal to 70 Let's set uh, gravity equal to minus 9.81. Uh, 
and let's define a variable, just call it uh, y prime. So y prime will be the time, let me see, y prime. Y prime will be the time derivative of the position, which is just the velocity. So that's just equal to uh, y1. It's the first, second component of y, but since it indexes from zero, it's the uh, y1. So let's define um, the velocity prime, the acceleration, and that is going to be equal to um, g, and it's that, that simple. So, and now we're just going to return, uh, we'll return it as a list, uh, y prime v prime, and save. So now that we're done with the function, we can just come down a few lines, and we're going to put our initial conditions. We're going to create a vector called y0, and the initial position is 32,000 meters and the initial velocity is zero. We're going to need a uh, variable for our start and start times and end times. So the start time will be zero. The end time, well, it's going to take about 80 seconds, we know, just from, you know, kinematics. So we're just going to put in 90 seconds and see what happens. And we need to create a variable called t eval, which is going to be the points that it actually evaluates. So this is going to be in np.lin space. And I'm just going to do it from 0 to 90, and I'm going to grab the uh, grab these entries out of the t-span variable, just so that I can change it later without having to change uh, change things in two spots. And we're just going to have a thousand points. So that's done now. Let's save again. Oh, there's a slight typo here. Let's get rid of this. Oh, save. Okay, now we're ready to actually uh, call our integration function. So, we're just going to create a uh, an object called SOL, SOL for solution, and it'll just be a call to our solve IVP uh, routine. And I'm also going to grab the position and time from our solution um, vector, or solution object, and now let's do some plotting. So uh, let's see, plt.plot t, and y is going to be, uh, the position is going to be the first row, so that's going to be row 0 and all columns, and let's just make this a black um, black line, and plt.show. Good. Oops, I see two issues here. One, this should just be, that should not be there, and this should be a colon, not a semicolon. Save it. Okay, now let's just run it. Uh, equations not defined. Why is it not defined? Equation, that's what, go up here. oh, it's equation. This should be an S. Now let's run it. Okay, let's see. It should be about 80 seconds before it hits zero. So we go here, 80. That looks about right. Um, now there's one thing here that's kind of inconvenient, is that this just shoots down way below zero. So we can solve that by adding an event detection um, function to our solver and have it terminate the integration when it reaches some event, or like when it crosses, when um, the curve crosses zero. So let's go and, and let's go in and do that. So we need to create an events function, and the events function is going to provide a, a routine that determines when some condition is equal to zero. So here we have our zeroth component of the y vector, which is our position, that minus our terminal height, the, t the height we want to end the integration is um, going to be set equal to zero. So this is a little confusing. Let's, if this were to be set at uh, 10, this would stop the integration when y was equal to 10. But we're going to explicitly set it y equals to y is equal to zero. And then we are going to uh, write events dot terminal equals true. So you could set. Uh, so we'll actually terminate the integration when when that is um, when that event is detected. And then we just come down here and add events equals events to our function. And then we run it. And there we go. It terminates at uh, when it crosses zero and at about 80 seconds, which is what we want. 
so I've added a couple lines here off of camera. One is this uh, printing out of the um, the uh, time that the event is detected. In other, in other words, the time that it hits the ground. Um, so if you were actually to use this in some sort of production code, you might want to check that this is not an empty vector. Otherwise, just printing it might might throw an error. And I also changed the plotting uh, code to print, plot out the position as we did before in one but I did it in a subplot here, and then to the right of that, I pr uh, plotted out the velocity because later on, it's going to ask for those plots. So let's just go through and rerun it here. So yeah, here are our plots. Um, again, we're about 80, 81 seconds, which is what we'd expect, and also kind of confirmation that we're correct. Uh, since we know we have constant acceleration, um, the slope of our velocity as a function of time should be linear, which is which is indeed what we see here. So let's actually get the number that it prints out for the final flight time. 80.77 seconds, and since it wants it to the nearest second, that's 81 seconds, which is exactly what we got with pen and paper. So now let's move on to the uh, adding in the air resistance. Okay, drag force. So we're going to need a constant C2. So let's C2 equals 0 0.5. And our drag force is given as this. So the drag force is minus C2. Um, the first component of our y vector is the velocity. So this is what we want here. So our velocity um, vector with, you know, with the proper sign times the absolute vo value of the velocity. So this guarantees that our velo the drag force is always pointing in the opposite direction of the velocity. So I'm actually going to rewrite our uh, acceleration down here. I'm going to write this as minus m times g. And I'm just going to do this for clarity. I don't know if I'd actually do this in a real, uh, a real code. And then minus, um, I'm sorry, plus f drag. And then I'm going to divide that by m. And save it. So now let's go and run it. Oh, actually, I, um, yeah, and now the results look funny. And that is because I, let's close that window here. Um, I'm double counting the, I, I have set the acceleration uh, due to gravity as negative, and then I kind of put another negative sign in down here. So let's go up here and set that g is equal to positive. So that should uh, fix things. So there we go. Uh, we're not hitting the ground yet, so we have to expand our integration time. Let's go back here. I don't know what the integration time would be, so let's just say, I don't know, what would be a good time? Let's say 600 seconds is probably overkill, but let's do it anyways. No, it's not overkill. Yeah, so there we go. That's what we got here. We get roughly a little more than 800 seconds by the graph. Let me see what this um, says here. 800, 866 seconds. Now, while we can't solve for the time with pen and paper, one check we can do is to look at it, what velocity this actually kind of becomes a constant at. That we could easily estimate um, by hand. That constant velocity is called terminal velocity, which in the case of a parachutist whose chute doesn't open is aptly named. Uh, but we can calculate it just by noting that if the velocity is constant, then the net force on the, on the skydiver is zero. And so we just plug in zero for the uh, total force and go back to Newton's second law, rearrange the equation, and solve for the velocity, which I show here on the slide. And the number we get by doing this agrees nicely with the solution that we got from our numerical code. So for the last part, they want us to have g, the acceleration uh, due to gravity, as a function of position. So we could just do that. That's the equation they gave us. And let's eliminate this. And also, c2 is a function of height. So let's eliminate this line. And we'll just copy and paste in our equation. So there we go. Oh, and we're also going to need, uh, gravity is going to need this, um, value of r0 and we have to put an h which i believe was 8000 8000 so now let's run it let's go to the where's my console 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 
there we go so the interpretation here if we look at this um, velocity graph here uh, we're f falling through relatively you know relative vacuum until we get to a lower altitude and the air resistance begins to become more and more of a factor and it begins to slow us down more and more and more and more and we have a longer free fall time here of like uh, 381 seconds that's compared to um, uh, no air resistance and constant gravity, but that's obviously less than with with air resistance because we're falling through what is essentially vacuum for a while until we hit the denser part of the atmosphere. So this was a quick introduction to SciPy's ODE solver. I was in quite the hurry this time, so there are things I forgot to mention, but those things can be easily found in the documentation are not that big of a deal. So as usual, this code will be up on GitHub, and talk to you guys later.